Hello, hello. I am incredibly excited to be here with you today. I don't know if my mic is on, so give me a second. Let me figure that part out because right now, I think it's not giving me any noise. Okay, yes, it is. It is the wrong mic. Oh, no. There we go. Mic check, mic check. Awesome. Very good. Super excited to be here with you all today. Hey, Roxanne. Thanks for showing up. Um, I appreciate you guys showing up every single week. Today, we are going to dive into some fiction versus some fact. Scope of practice is always something that it's like, you know, it really grinds my gears. <laughs> People who, who really just don't grasp the full scope of practice conversation. And it's not just the general scope of practice conversation, honestly. It's the totality of how many professionals are really unaware of what the facts are when it comes to uh, scope of practice. So hopefully we're all going to gain a significant amount of clarity, if nothing else, okay? So I want to welcome you all in, whether you are, you know, front office team, if you are an assistant, you're a hygienist, you're a dentist, you are very welcome here. There's a lot to know and to understand because when we're implementing myofunctional therapy, it's really for everybody in dentistry to understand the scope of practice. That way we can practice as safely as possible. And everybody gets real nervous when you do that whole safely thing, right? Well, before we dive too deep, let me not dampen the mood or I'll bring up the mood before I dampen it. My birthday is actually on Easter this year. So it falls Easter Sunday, which is super exciting for me um, because every now and then that happens. And I am so excited because I'm giving a gift out to everyone. Okay. So you'll all be able to sail to, to save some money this Easter uh, weekend now through April 5th. I have an official offer. Everything will come at the end, but I wanted to just pop this in right at the beginning. It'll pop up again towards the end. Okay. So just going to brighten up the mood before I just take everybody's mood all the way down. So anytime I open up my inbox, whether that is my messenger inbox, um, that could be on LinkedIn, I get messages, it could be on Facebook, uh, in my inbox inbox, like my email inbox, the amount of emails I get with like incorrect information, it's mind boggling. And so every single time I open up my inbox, it's always like, oh my gosh, it's the same thing again, where somebody's trying to talk to me about scope of practice as if they understand it remotely. And so that's what created this whole lecture today. So if you feel confused, if you feel like, you know, the last message I had gotten where somebody had said, you know, oh, I love that myofunctional therapy is in the scope of practice of registered dental hygienists, but airway isn't. I said, what? Like neither one is like, show me the state practice act. Neither one is. I don't know where people are getting these, this misinformation from. And hopefully we can all dispel a lot of that. And I can stop getting these messages because I really would like to send them now just a copy of this recording as my response instead of having to type out a fresh response every time. Okay. And if you sent me an email in the past, don't think you know, I feel any kind of way about it. Um, I'm happy to respond to all your emails, but we really need to like centralize all this information. So here's where some of the misinformation uh, comes from. When people talk about scope of practice, a lot of times they're talking about like, oh, it's in our scope of practice because it's in the ADHA policy recommendations. It's in the PRs, right? So let me take myself off the screen for just a second so that you can read this in totality. This was adopted in 2021. There is another PR that is there that's a little bit more abbreviated and doesn't really take up the fullness that this does. But the ADHA or the American Dental Hygienist Association does acknowledge and support registered dental hygienists who are educated in OMT. The dental hygienist educated in OMT may provide oral facial myofunctional assessments and treatment independently in a variety of practice settings and for patients of all ages. 
yay, it sounds like a win, right? Like, oh yeah, we're supported. It's in our scope of practice. No, the ADHA is not a regulatory body. The ADHA really doesn't have much weight in anything other than the fact that it's a professional organization that does have lobbyists and so forth. And so they can lobby and petition, but on the list of priorities, okay, when we don't have all 50 states where people can administer low, uh, admin, can administer local anesthesia. There we go. We don't have all 50 states where we can do laser work, where we don't have all 50 states where we can administer Botox. There's so many other things that are already passed, independent hygiene, uh, the ability to become a dental therapist as a you know registered dental hygienist in various states. There are so many things that would take top priority don't think that they're out there lobbying for you to get myofunctional therapy in your scope of practice. And there's a number of reasons why, okay? And I am not on any board at the American Dental Hygienist Association, so I'm not speaking for them. But if I was on the board, I can tell you that that wouldn't be my top priority because like there's only a handful of us that are looking for that, whereas there's the greater totality and percentage of people who are looking for local anesthesia, hello state of Texas, who are looking for all these other things that we haven't been able to do that we know our peers in other states are able to do. So the ADHA really doesn't hold any weight. This is a wonderful thing to go back to and say, yay, they support us. I love being supported, but their support in the grand scheme of scope of practice for our dental state practice acts means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. Their PRs also state that they recommend that, you know, everybody's able to do local anesthesia. That's not going to fly if you start doing it in Texas. Like you're not legally allowed to do that. It is not in your scope of practice. Nobody cares what the American Dental Hygienist Association says. So you just got to be really clear with that off the bat, okay? So what does that mean for us? It just means we keep everything separated. You got to keep it separated. Myofunctional therapy and registered dental hygiene have barely, if any, crossover. They really don't have much crossover at all. You're doing a lot more mental work than you are tactile work when you're doing myofunctional therapy. And that's assessment or evaluation or whatever you want to call it, intake, whatever you want to call it. That's that aside. For the most part, it is a therapy and a modality where you are instructional instructional. Yeah, you're instructional in nature, okay, where you are actually giving instructions and guiding your patients to something. So it's more verbal. You're doing physical cues. Uh, you're not necessarily, you know, manipulating muscle tissue on your own in order to stimulate and to get everything. You know what I'm saying? It's totally separate for the most part. And so I don't see why anybody would want it to overlap because they're two frames of mind that are entirely different, entirely different. When you're in clinical hygiene, you have protocols, you have standards, you have a process that you are to follow every single patient, every single time. And Ideally, we would like more time to do a lot of that process, but you can fit a good chunk of that into an hour long appointment. You can fit your protocols in there. That's not necessarily how myofunctional therapy works. A lot of times, especially when you get a larger caseload, you're not going to know and or understand what it is that you're supposed to be doing with every patient every single time. I go back and I look at everybody's notes and I'm like, what were we doing again? Oh yes, this one was at this stage of the program. Okay, we got to reevaluate because we had something happen or they went on a cruise or blah, 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 blah. And so I'm always constantly shifting my frame of thought. Are we doing an evaluation? That's an entirely different frame of thought from somebody who is graduating, from somebody who's in the middle of the program, from somebody who's starting the program. And all of these things can happen back to back to back. And I have to continue to change my mental frame. Whereas we know the tools may vary, right? But the processes are relatively the same from patient to patient to patient when you are in hygiene, okay? So yes, we do have these two that are really not really alike. I, I don't know why we would want them to be together, but that's a, a thought process that's out there too. So for right now, while they're separate, because it's not in any of the 50 dental state practice acts, 
while it's separate, practice separately. So take that hygiene hat off, clock out from your hygiene. Uh, don't have the same, you know, payment structure or status if that's where you are, if you're in a practice or completely separate your business. Because imagine if, and I always use this, imagine if you decide as a hygienist or a dentist, you decide you're going to become a yoga instructor and you do all the coursework to become a yoga instructor. At what point do you start teaching yoga while you're in clinical dentistry? Never, right? You don't. There Would there be benefits for it? Absolutely. Might you be able to get some of your patients back a little further, like your patients who aren't as flexible, who struggle with mobility? Absolutely. There might be uses for it. Should you do that while you are in clinical hygiene? No. And you understand that in its totality without further explanation, because these two things don't even sound alike, okay? As for the talk about why we have to use our dental hygiene license in order to take a course and why is that a prerequisite and so shouldn't they be associated? No, it's really just going off of your knowledge to be 100% honest. That's all I think it is because we'll get into regulation in just a minute, but there are no regulatory bodies. There are none. And I know that that's been promoted and I have a friend who's been promoting that um, who had a very very big blog post that was full of contradictions uh, recently. And it's not, it's not a thing. It's not regulated. Um, we'll get into that. We'll get into that in just a second. Let me just stay on my one train of thought. Okay. So you have your dental hygiene license. And it's really just all the education that you have on oral function, oral health, oral development, oral embryology, all of this stuff that really does help with learning and integrating myofunctional therapy as your next step. So it's like a stepping stone, yes, but they're not related in tasks, in daily function, in mental, you know, aptitude. It, it's not the same at all, okay? To keep it separated. I thought this little meme was funny too because of the diastema and that's what it was. So hopefully it gave some of you a little giggle, okay? So regulation. For everybody who's confused about what regulation is, regulation is a rule or a law or an order that is put into place by an authority. It's your state legislature, okay? For all of your states, because we're talking about dental and what's in scope of practice. So it's not a federal thing. It is a state by state by state thing for our practice acts, for your dental practice acts. So regulation, okay, is managing the rules where, where we've got the law, we have and understand what the law is. Now we have to control what is going on, who's following the law, who's not following the law. Regulation happens with your board of dentistry, your dental state board, okay? They are regulatory in nature in almost all of the states, okay? We'll, we'll touch base on a little bit of what they can and cannot do, but in almost all of the states, they are not legislative, legislation, is the process of writing or enacting laws by a legislative body. So bills happen and are produced in the House or the State Senate, but they are not done at your board of dentistry. They are not done at the board that overrules all of the boards. It's not done there. So what's happening is legislation is created by legislative bodies, the House, the governor, your uh, state senate, and then everything else is regulated. Once it's implemented, it's regulated by the board, okay? So you have to understand the difference between these two. There is no regulatory body because we don't have any laws or legislation on myofunctional therapy. So go to your Dental State Practice Act. I've already looked at all 50. Okay, I've done that numerous times over, looked at all 50, and in zero of them are there any mentions of the words myofunctional therapy, oral myofunctional disorders, oral facial myology, any of that terminology. It's not in your Dental State Practice Act. 
please go look. If it is not in the laws, if it is not in the legislation, your board cannot rule or regulate it. It doesn't make sense. They don't create laws. They rule on laws that already exist. So if it's not written there, you asking them to create it or add it doesn't make sense. You really need to go lobby your state senator, your house legislators. You really need to go lobby against the people who actually create and write bills. I don't think that's a priority for them. And we'll get into that for a second. Um, but if you are talking about scope of practice, you can only go off of what you know there are laws for. Nobody's regulating this thing if there are no laws for it. Now, here's the exception. In a couple of states, and I would love everybody to go look because I haven't looked in the last year. Um, so things could have changed in the last year, but there were only three states, and I'm not going to tell you which ones. You guys need to really go and look that up. In three states, the Speech and Audiology Practice Act actually states that the treatment and assessment of oral facial or treatment and evaluation of, it depends on which state you're looking at, oral myofunctional disorders is within the scope of practice of speech language pathologists. That is in their practice act. That is law. Okay. That means that oral myofunctional disorders in that state or wherever it is, is under the regulation of that speech and audiology board, okay? So those speech and audiology boards can actually regulate it. Dentistry doesn't have that. We are not regulated. We don't have it in the scope of practice, not for dentists and not for hygienists, okay? Not for anybody, not for assistants, not for front office staff. It's there for nobody, okay? So, what does that mean for us? The Board of Dentistry does promulgate rules. Now, promulgate promulgation is putting out or uh, announcing of sorts any rules that are put into effect by the state legislator. So it's announcing that, yes, there's this new rule, this new regulation that affects and impacts dentistry. And they have to announce because how else would you know that there's new law, new regulation, new things that are happening if you're not told or informed? So the Board of Dentistry is required to inform the public that these new laws are in effect. So they promulgate laws, okay, that affect anything in dentistry. But any sort of authority or limitations beyond that are imposed by legislative mandates. So unless your state legislature has said, hey, you guys can make whatever rules you want and then we will write it and sign it as a bill and put it into law, that's not what happens. And as far as I know, there, there's not too many places where that does happen. So here's the facts. And this is straight from the ADA and I've spoken to several lawyers over the course of the last couple of years trying to get the nitty gritty on this topic. So if there's anybody who is knowledgeable about it, it is I. Uh, this is the totality of what your board of dentistry is able to do, okay? So they're given the right to regulate anything that's in the state legislature for the Dental State Practice Acts, okay? They govern and they have an ability to establish any qualifications for licensure. So if licensure, let's say you took the WRDE and, you know, the NERB is the one that they wanted you to take and they decided they're going to accept now grades from the WRDE or EB or whatever the different institutions are called that you could take these different examinations from. And now they're accepting any sort of, uh, you know, board exams from both institutions. They can decide that. They've got free rule. The legislature of the state doesn't care where they're accepting grades from or, you know, what those grades have to be in order to be passing. The state legislature doesn't care. Board of Dentistry, full rights to do that, okay? Does somebody get a license over somebody else not getting a license? Do we revoke a license versus, you know, changing the status of another license instead of revoking it? We're just going to change the status. That's also up to them. They don't want the nitty gritty. 
why would our state legislators want to be involved in like the nitpicking of like, okay, this is that and that one's that and this one's a dentist and this one's no longer hygienist and this one is malpractice. They don't want anything to do with that. Okay. So mm, take that out of the equation. All right. So that's disciplinary action. That's your licensure and you know, what's happening with the licensure and announcing the laws. That's what they can do. That's it. Bada bing, bada boom. They don't write any more laws. They don't control whether or not myofunctional therapy is in scope of practice. Is it in, is it written in the Dental State Practice Act as a scope of practice? Yes or no? And if, I, I want you to really stretch your brains for just a little bit to think if the Board of Dentistry was solely responsible for that and on almost all of the boards, there is diversity. So you have like a hygienist on a board, you have your dentist, you have sometimes you have a person that is from just the general public. So you have a group of people who might be really easy to lobby to. Wouldn't we have more laws and legislation that were favorable for whatever reason, if all we had to do was lobby to like five people on a dental board, and then something can be written into law? I mean, it just seems logical to me that if I only had to talk to five people, I'm going to whine and dine the mess out of them. These are not like elected officials where, you know, I have to worry about, okay, is my neighbor going to vote for John? He's on the dental board because of, you know, process, the due process, whatever that process is. But it's never, you know, you're voting on a ballot for who's on your dental board. Mm -mm, no. So if I get to decide what the laws are, and I'm just one of five people or whatever, of course, they're going to be favorable, right? No. So when we lobby, we're lobbying, actually, to our state legislatures, to the people who have a greater disinterest <laughs> in dentistry, and probably have their own agendas that they're trying to push forward. And every now and then, you know, they will throw in something for whoever's giving them the most money, whoever's donating and yada, yada. There's a lot into how a bill will become a law. And understanding that process is a thing in and of itself. And I'll tell you as somebody who, if you Google me, a lot of times my ballotopedia comes up, which is like Wikipedia, but for people who have been on ballots uh, to be elected, my ballotopedia comes up. I did run for governor of New Jersey in 2016. Um, and then subsequently I was on the ballot for lieutenant governor, but that's neither here nor there. There's a lot to understand about government and law. And if you don't understand it, don't speak on it. That is my big like pet peeve. If you don't get it, don't speak on it. If you don't know if it's in our scope of practice, don't say that it is. It doesn't make you look smarter to be purporting to be purporting to be putting forth information that is false okay it actually makes us all collectively look worse because now it's like oh we're all practicing this thing we shouldn't be practicing or we're all standing on this hill we shouldn't be standing on it's not in the scope of practice in any of the 50 states of the United States of America okay how could it come there lobbying lobbying to your house, to the Senate, if you know a legislature, if you know a governor who would have influence actually among the other uh, legislatures of the state, sure, they might write that bill. That bill is then introduced. Then there's hearings and actions and more hearings and actions. And during all of this, lobbying is happening and we're trying to influence the vote. And then it's referred back to the House. And then it goes to the governor, yay! Goes to the governor, governor signs. And then the next following year is when you get the law. Okay, so a bill for a state really takes time it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort. And I really, really, really do not believe that we are ever at any risk whatsoever of getting it in dental state practice acts. Here's why. One, it's not, well, actually I have a whole, yeah, here's why. Nobody cares. 
okay? Nobody cares enough to actually go through this whole process for myofunctional therapy. Myofunctional therapy is not big enough. Uh, there's not enough dental professionals who are finding it profitable enough to even do so. Like that wouldn't even make one and one two in that situation. Nobody really generally cares about whether or not myofunctional therapy is in a scope of practice or not in a scope of practice. And when you when several dental state boards have been asked, they always say, no, it's not in the scope of practice. More recently, New York had that and everybody is like up in arms. Oh, no, we got to do this and we got to file a petition. We got to do whatever to tell these people who regulate on the laws and who have read the law and have not seen any of those words, myofunctional therapy, oral facial myology, or anything associated with that at all in any combination of those possible words, that we're what, petitioning against what? They can't make a law. It's not in your scope of practice. It's never been, and it's not going to be. But here's the, the greatest reason why. There's just too many educational institutions. There's zero regulation. Okay. So we know that when we go to dental school, you go to assisting school, you go to hygiene school, you go to school and you know that CODA is regulating all of your education. We're all getting generally the same education, right? That way we're able to take the same standardized boards, right? And then we're practicing relatively the same. Does that mean that we get, you know, reciprocity? Of course not. I mean, I don't know why we why we keep asking for this thing that only makes sense. But no, we don't get reciprocity, but everything is standardized. There's so many educational institutions now. And even within the educational institutions, like take the IAOM, for example, they have courses within courses and all of those courses are all the different now. Okay, they used to have a standardized process among courses. Now they just, any old body who has a course, come on, bring it over to the IAOM. Like, if, what does that even mean? There is zero standardization, not among courses or among practitioners. What I do in my practice and the amount of modalities I add in my practice and like how I practice and like some of the emails that I get with people who are struggling with like certain things and then I, I give them like, tips or exercises or tools or recommendations, things that I would never even think that other people struggle with, but they struggle with. What's happening in my program clearly isn't happening in other people's programs. What's happening in, you know, uh, let me, Angie Lehman's program is not what's happening in my program. That doesn't make her any less effective. It just makes our programs different. What's happening in Joy Lance's program is not happening in my program. That doesn't make her any less effective. It just makes us different. We're all equally effective. We're all fantastic practitioners, but who's going to say, I need to stop doing what I'm doing in my program and start doing more of what that person's doing. Who's going to create that standardization? Like who's in charge of that? Which educational institution are we choosing to be the one for which all of the standardization is supposed to be taught? Who's in charge of that? I don't know. And then what research are we basing it on? Because we know that in America, myofunctional therapy is imaginary. It is not a thing, y'all. It's not a thing. There's no legislation no regulation, even when it's in the, uh, the Speech and Audiology Practice Acts, it's the treatment of oral facial myofunctional disorders. It's not myofunctional therapy, oral facial myology, da 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 da. It's just oral facial myofunctional disorders and the treatment of such. It has nothing to do with myofunctional therapy because when you go to the research for myofunctional therapy, it's a handful of exercises. It's a handful of a protocol because you have to have standardization to do research. You can't have standardization, you know, be all willy nilly and just do a bunch of different things on a bunch of different people and call it research. You've got to have the same protocol. And then there's no long-term studies with like a bunch of people. So how long have people remained habituated? Have you done a study on a group of 10, 20, 30, 40,000 people with standardized processes and protocols, seen success long-term, and then called yourself an evidence-based field? Myofunctional therapy doesn't have that. There was an article uh, that Dr. Kazarian, I want to say, is what it was, a sleep 
physician. I want to say he was a sleep physician, whatever. He had wrote this wonderful blog where he essentially said this same thing. Like y'all don't have the research to stand behind myofunctional therapy being a thing. So I am never going to refer to a myofunctional therapist because it doesn't make sense for me to do so. There's no research to stand on on which to do this. Maybe if we're in Brazil and it is a uh, program that is regulated and like postgraduate, like educational, it's instituted and everything is the same, it's standardized. But in America, there's no reason for any of that. It makes sense. It's a, not a thing. It's practically, you know, it's practically 100% made up by functional therapy. That doesn't make it any less efficient um, or effective. It has changed the lives of many. I've seen it, but it's not regulated, y'all. There's no legislation for it. It is not a thing. Please, please, let's do better collectively. Let's ensure that when we are talking about this field that we are so passionate about, we're not lying to ourselves first, because if you've ever thought you've emailed me and said something, you were lying to yourself, not to me, okay? You have to stand on the truth. If we're going to make any progress forward with myofunctional therapy, uh, one day in the far, far distant future, maybe becoming a thing. Okay. For right now, for what it is, it's important that collectively we're all speaking the truth. There is no legislation. It is not regulated by a dental board. There's not a single dental board that has a reason to put it into any sort of legislation, even if they had that power. There's not a single board that has any sort of reason to do it. Dental professionals are losing their investment in myofunctional therapy at three times the rate of other professionals, probably because when speech therapists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, and other professionals implement myofunctional therapy, they don't do it as a sole field. They don't do it as a sole practice. They do it in addition to what it is they're already doing, right? So that is very much um, the long and the short of what's going on with regulation and, and legislation and the difference between such, okay? So I will get to my last slide in just a second. I see a question and I'm, I'm gonna put that up here. Uh, thank you, Roxanne, for this. Certification doesn't mean anything. It's a class you went through. You are like spot on. Certification means Diddly squat. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything at all. If you are certified from an institution, it just means that you're very proficient at that institution's methods and, you know, their, their ways. So you have achieved whatever their standards were to get that certification. Certification currently also not a regulated thing. Like it, it's just not something that is regulated. I'm sorry. The the dental, the Department of Education, I'm sorry, is who really does a lot of the validation behind it. And so if you need a accrediting body and it's, it's just not a thing. It's not a thing, y'all. And it doesn't mean anything anyway. There's so many people who have no idea what myofunctional therapy is. The last thing they care about is if you've been certified and the thing that they don't even know what it is, like what you do myofascial, what you do myofun, what you do myo, what they don't understand what it is. So myofunctional therapy, it, it's, it's not a thing. Certification isn't a thing. Regulation isn't a thing. Scope of practice isn't a thing. That doesn't mean that you can't still practice with excellence. You can still practice with significant amounts of excellence. Okay. So I've got a link for everybody um, because I'm doing this wonderful birthday sale. I'm so excited about my birthday being on Easter. It's going to be so much fun. Um, and I have a couple of days off. Like I literally have a weekend off and I work like every weekend. And so I'm really excited. Yay. Um, grab this link, carieslaguerre.com. Don't spell my name wrong. It's K-A-R-E-S-E-L-A-G. U E R R E dot com uh, slash sale. I have several courses and opportunities that are on sale where you can save anywhere from $50 to $3,000 during this sale. Like, yes, I have discounted things that far from 50 to $3,000. You can save up 
between now and April 5th, I want to say. But my birthday is on the 31st of March. So, you know, do me a birthday solid and <laughs> get your savings early so that I could really, really enjoy my birthday and celebrate with all the wonderful new practitioners and professionals who are going to stop making myo mistakes and start making myo millions. You deserve to be profitable in myofunctional therapy. I am tired of getting all these messages equally outside of the scope of practice of people who really did not get all that they should have gotten out of their introductory courses. The main problem with that is that you're not getting on-site mentorship. Nobody's coming to you. Nobody is looking and seeing what you're doing over your shoulder. I can hand you a curette and I can talk to you all day about the curette. But if I never use it, you don't see me use it. I don't watch you try to use it. I'm not looking at you doing anything with this curette. I don't see if you actually got calculus off with it. What was the purpose of all that lecturing that I did for you? And that is why a lot of dental professionals are struggling and failing. And I don't want that to be the case. I would like everybody to be as efficient as possible when they are doing myofunctional therapy, because the only way that this is going to ever advance itself forward is if we have more dental practitioners practicing this profitably and proficiently. And so that is my passion. Um, that's a big part of why this sale is going on. Tell your friends, get everybody that you can involved. It's an incredibly important mission that we stop failing at myofunctional therapy and start doing all of the good work that we were all intended to do and put forth on this earth to do. All right. I wanted to be done in 30 minutes, but I have gone a little bit early over, a little bit over. I am so happy to have spent this time with you all. Thank you so much for showing up. I appreciate you all. Thank you for the birthday comments in the um in the feed. I appreciate that. Thank you. I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. And if you're not enjoying or celebrating the holiday, then at least enjoy hopefully what you have as a three-day weekend. Looking forward to seeing you all next week for another fantastic live. Bye, everyone. <laughs>